Am I Evil by Jack Mangan. Based on Am I Evil by Brian Tatler and Sean Harris. Originally released on the album Lightning to the Nations by Diamond Head, 1980. Chapter 3 Bishop Henrik, Eugene, and my brother Paul had dismounted, tying their horses to a post in front of Cliff's home. I could just make out Henrik's voice. Paul searched the grounds while we talked to Cliff. Vander was susceptible to your mother's evil. We must determine if he's a threat to the 27. Anger wrapped around me like a cloak against the cold. Eugene was the first to see my approach. Oi, who goes there? Henrik looked up sharply. State your name, good sir. I stopped a stone's throw away. There are no good sirs here. All three of them were standing now, facing me. My brother furthest away. Eugene the closest. He took a step. Look, mate, we have business with the blacksmith. So I suggest that you... Flashes between black. The next sequence is incomplete in my memory. Cliff's dagger from my belt into my hand. Their weariness turned to slow alarm. The blade buried to its hilt in Eugene's forehead, blood warm and wet on my hand. Henrik and Paul were shouting, but I didn't process. Eugene's body went limp, his legs crumpling beneath his lifeless form. My grip on the dagger pulled my arm down as he fell. I shoved him down with my boot to pull the blade free. Awareness trickled slowly back behind my eyes. Still some distance away, my brother Paul had drawn his Estoc sword, was pointing the blade at me. More ward than challenge. What did you do? He'd always gotten a shrill edge in his voice in times of fear, like his twin, Alve. We want no trouble. Take what you need and go, Henrik said. There's no need for any more bloodshed. Oh, yes, there is. Sound of a door latch. Movement in my right peripheral. I didn't look, but was aware of Cliff stepping into his open doorway. What the hell is going on out here? No remorse. I let fly the dagger. End over end it turned, departed my open hand, closing on my brother where he stood. It sought his heart, but narrowly missed. The point plunged deep into the flesh just beneath his collarbone. Paul gasped. He stepped back into the hitching post, slumped down to sit against it, a look of glassy fear upon his face. The knife handle jutted out from his chest, painting a growing circle of red on his coat. Surprising me again with his swiftness, Cliff was at Paul's side. The blacksmith crouched down, looking at him with concern. At the same time, Henrik shouted and broke to run. In his thoughtless panic, he left the horses and tried to flee on foot. Alive with the fever of it now, I moved to intercept him, that I might drag him back, pull the blade from Paul, and oof, I grunted my lungs expelling breath like a bellows. Cliff's shoulder had connected hard with my midsection. This takedown was clumsier than his previous one, back on the island, but just as effective. He tackled me hard to the earth, landed with his full weight on top of me. He looked up and shouted, Save yourself! Go! I was aware of Henrik picking up speed again, running back up the road in the direction from whence he'd come. I gasped for Cliff to get off of me, desperate to catch Henrik before he got away. Cliff did step up, but not in obeisance. He moved to place himself between me and the receding, escaping form of the bishop. You're only alive until I run out of questions, Cliff said. His expression was fierce, boring into me with a rage I'd never seen from him. First question. Why have you attacked these men? In the flurry and blood, I'd almost forgotten the disguise. My fight was still up. I don't care about your questions, just my revenge. A change came over him. His stance, his anger, his control. He looked at me with a mix of amazement and distaste. Could it be? A groan sounded, weak and pain-riddled, from just across the yard. I fought through aches to sit upright. Cliff was again crouched at my brother's side. Am I dead? Paul said. Not yet, said Cliff. 
I stood now and approached, standing over them. Cliff eyed me warily. Paul stared up from beneath heavy eyelids. Who are you? My face is long forgot. Wonder crept into his slackened features. Brother? The word infuriated me, coming from his lips. I swept in close to him, grabbing his bloody lapel in one hand, holding his face close to mine. His eyes flickered fear, but he could muster nothing more. Cliff was standing apart now. He made no move to stop me. My name is Vander. My mother was a witch. She was burned alive. Three of her sons took part in her murder. My other hand had closed on Paul's estoc hilt, lying in the snow next to him. I picked it up and drove its long blade through his ribs. His final breath released in broken gasps. I have no brothers. His head slumped forward, chin against his chest. I suddenly felt nearly as drained, nearly as lifeless, aware but uncaring of the threat of the blacksmith standing nearby. I allowed myself to slump down to a sitting position before Paul, bowed my head. Are you going to kill me now? I said, looking up at Cliff. I don't know, he said. Are you going to kill me? There was a tingling sensation on my face. I felt my upper lip. The mustaches were receding somehow, almost gone. My nose felt close to its normal size again. The spell was wearing off. Cliff watched the sorceress transformation, nonplussed, betraying no reaction. You were sloppy with these two, and lucky, he said. And obviously aided by some kind of illusion spell. But maybe you're not as hopeless as I thought. The bishop should be dead, too. Cliff's expression steeled, as it had before Rhea earlier. But he nodded agreement. Aye, he deserves it, as did these two, as do the rest. Henrik will be back with numbers, but I'll tell them the mustachioed ruffian escaped to the southern road. Your disguise worked. No suspicion will come your way. I'm sure he didn't know it was you. Cliff stood with a sigh, stretching stiffly. In combat, he'd moved with the grace and speed of a man twenty years younger. But in stillness, his spine bent toward his true age. I wasn't always just a simple blacksmith and an elder of good, he said. I spent my younger days as an assassin for the prince. I know a thing or two about killing. Ah, there you are again. His gaze drifted back to me, recognition in his eyes. I touched my face again, noted my familiar natural features with relief. My own bare face. Some part of me had feared that the disguise enchantment would never wear away. Stay on here with me as my apprentice, Vander, for a little while at least. You can sleep in the smithy. I'll keep the elders at bay, and I'll teach you my two specialties, metalworks and death. Anger found its heat within me again. Twenty-seven devils murdered my mother last night. I only care to kill the twenty-four who still live. Gotta see to make them pay the price. Yes, well, a double dozen murders is a lot, isn't it? Especially as clumsy and artless as you are. He paced a bit in the snow. There are two conditions for becoming my apprentice. The first, no bloodshed. Not until I allow it. And the second, stay away from Rhea. Did we understand each other? I felt the blush rise from my throat, but I pushed thoughts of her aside. I don't understand why you'd teach me to kill. As soon as you let your guard down, I'm coming for you, too. He stopped pacing. The moment froze, precarious, like an icicle hanging from an eve. I'm counting on it, he said softly. My heartbeat slowed to near death. Cliff stepped forward, extending his gloved hand to me once again. Now get up and help me with these bodies. I accepted. He pulled me to my feet. Chapter 4 Cliff's tutelage began immediately, 
I spent each day training in his smithy and yard and rarely left his homestead. His wooden sword drills were repetitive, exhausting, deeply frustrating, painful. The work in the smithy was even more demanding, even more tiring. By nightfall each day, the sweat of labor and practice had begun to freeze on my skin and clothes. The first week was the most difficult, but I had already begun to feel the change. I was stronger, more fleet of foot, and even found some joy in the shaping of metals. Repairing Mrs. Penny's tea kettle had been tremendously satisfying. Days passed, then weeks, and so paused my vengeance. Even when it had an opportunity, just five days into my apprenticeship. I'd been boiling carrots at Cliff's kitchen hearth when the bishop had arrived with his guards. Cliff, his brothers hadn't seen him since Bones Island. We'd feared the worst, but then a trapper reported seeing him here. Vander is my assistant. He's not under arrest. He's under my protection. Their conversation took place by the door, out of sight of me. Unaware, I could eavesdrop. Cliff's voice was acid calm. It would be well for you to remember my past life in service of the prince. Is that a threat? The bishop's voice makes confusion, annoyance. Maybe your posse should focus on finding that ruffian who attacked us and robbed my workshop. He's been at large for almost a week. I walked away from the roiling pot, stood at Cliff's side in the doorway, still holding the paring knife. Reactions played across the bishop's face like a shuffling of cards. The men with Henrik were no elders, no common parishioners or cloth from his church. They looked well accustomed to violence. But it was Cliff's presence that stayed my hand, not theirs. The bishop nodded to his men, and they began to disperse. Very well, he said, looking from Cliff to me. We shall see you both again soon. Cliff said nothing for a long time after they'd gone. Only when we sat down to our dried venison and carrots did he speak. If you'd killed the bishop, I'd have struck you down before his men could. Wise decision to respect my terms. Later that night, I would fail to keep his second condition. I woke from midnight sleep to a whisper, a hand on my shoulder. Vander. Ray was bent over my bed of straw in the smithy. I sat up quickly. Rhea. I know you said I should leave good, but she stoppered my words with her lips. A shudder of excitement in my chest, I returned the kiss. First on her mouth, then her neck and shoulders, the upper swell of her breast. The mat was slender and uneven. There was room enough for us both under its blankets. Her nighttime visits continued in the ensuing weeks. Cliff seemed unaware of these transgressions focused as we both were during daylight hours. Maintaining his property in smithy, completing metal jobs, preparing and storing foods, shoveling, and of course, my combat training. Swordsmanship, grappling, brawling, dueling, defenses, counters, stances. Though he berated my skills as pitiful, I could feel my improvement each day, every session. Most of the metalwork orders were for elders, the majority of those were carried out by servants, but a few transactions were negotiated in person. Stein, Hemming, Gerald, Eugene's widow. They all eyed me warily while talking to Cliff over their candle holders, jewelry, hinges, and other trinkets. I refrained from killing any of them in deference to my teacher's wishes. As familiarity grew between us, I also began to note the moments when his guard was down when even his quick reflexes would not be able to parry my sudden strike. In each of these cases, I held off, choosing to continue my advancement. I wasn't ready yet. I needed to avenge my mother upon all of the elders, not just this one. I'd continue to take my time. Foothills of stubborn snow littered the outskirts of the yards, persisting alongside the first blooms of spring. We faced each other in the muddied grass, both breathing heavily after a strenuous exchange of blows and parries. The soft iron of my practice sword was full of dents. His was nearly blunted to clay from all of its impacts on my armor. Fatigue and ache burned in both arms. I kept the battered rim of my shield before my face. Is it evil to kill? 
For bloodlust or greed? For revenge? Yes. He shuffled forward and moved back, maintaining distance. But for survival? Justice? War? No. For any of those, it can be right, even good. Before you move to slay, you must ask yourself, what kind of man does this make me? Am I good? Or am I evil? He lunged. My block was clumsy. The tip of his sword speared painfully into my shoulder plate. I shoved forward with the shield, driving him back a pace. Near breathless with exhaustion, I said, Was it good or evil when you killed for the prince? Then advanced for my own strength. Our swords locked and we drew up face to face, him standing just slightly taller. As gracefully as he moved, I could see weariness in the old man's eyes. He sighed deeply. A little bit of both. You're listening to the audiobook of Am I Evil, based on the Am I Evil novella, based on the Am I Evil graphic novel, based on the classic heavy metal song, written and made famous by Diamond Head and famously covered by Metallica, and later covered live by the Thrash Big Four of Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer, and Megadeth. Narration by me, Jack Mangan, the author of the graphic novel and the novella. All the legal stuff here, you know, you can't sell recordings or transcripts of this, blah, blah, blah. We're running an Indiegogo campaign in June 2023 to raise funds to produce high-quality print versions of the Am I Evil graphic novel with cover art by James F. Beveridge and all interior comic panel art and lettering by Kyle Burles, a.k.a. Kyohazard. Please swing over to Indiegogo and support our campaign to receive your own print and or PDF edition of the Am I Evil comic. And the ebook of this novella will also be available separately. Or for purchase information or just general information about Am I Evil, check us out at amievil-graphicnovel.com. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Indiegogo supporters. <laughs>